Welcome to the Human Rights Podcast series of Freedom of Assembly, Freedom of Expression and Rights Defenders in Turkey. I'm Beril Eski. Throughout the three episodes of this podcast series, produced with the support of the Association for Monitoring Equal Rights, the Truth, Justice and Memory Center, and the Netherlands Helsinki Committee, and in collaboration with Kısa Dalga Media, we will facilitate a better understanding of human rights in Turkey. We will be exploring the situation of freedom of assembly, freedom of speech and rights defenders, joined by prominent academics and human rights advocates. Oku, dinle, izle. Kısa Dalga. Welcome, Umut. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. So we're going to talk about the freedom of meetings and demonstrations. And um, I'd like to start with the concept to, of the right to meetings and demonstrations. What are the international standards? Are they? And what's the legal basis for this right? So in short, uh, the right to hold meetings and demonstrations or the right to freedom of assembly uh, guarantees our right to express ourselves collectively. So it does protect a particular form of free speech, uh, which is speech expressed through gatherings. Uh, but not all gatherings are protected under freedom of assembly for groups of people to be considered as uh, being protected by that right. They should be gathered with a common purpose, uh, often to convey an opinion. They don't have to express this opinion out loud, but uh, so the meeting can be in the form of silent sittings, for example, but they have to be there for a common purpose, uh, to take part in a religious gathering, to convey an idea, as I said, to show that they are proud of who they are, as is the case in LGBT marches. Uh, so this is why the common or purpose reason is the why, for example, the Saturday mothers are protected under the freedom of assembly, but not a group of people waiting in line in order to get into a, a public building, for example. Uh, the right does not only protect static gatherings either. Walkabouts, marches, sit-ins, parliamentary sessions, all can be covered. Protected, uh, all can be covered under this right. Uh, the legal basis of this right is found in the Constitution itself, Turkish Constitution itself, namely in Article 34. Uh, it provides that everyone has the right to hold meetings and demonstrations, hold unarmed uh, and peaceful meetings and demonstrations. Uh, without prior permission. We also have a statute dedicated specifically to public gatherings, uh, which is called the Law on Meetings and Demonstrations, uh, which contains a similar clause. Uh, there are other domestic provisions relevant to this right, but the main legal basis of this right are these two. Uh, as to the international legal basis, uh, Turkey is party to several international treaties protecting the freedom of assembly in various degrees. Uh, but the most relevant ones are uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, of course, there are other provisions in other international treaties, as I said, but most of today's international start- standards regarding this right were generated under these two and they, by the treaty bodies, uh, namely Human Rights Committee and the European Court of Human Rights. So... Are there any conditions to use the right to meetings and demonstrations and assembly in Turkey? Like, can you elaborate on this, maybe in comparison with the international standards? Uh, so international standards and domestic standards differ on certain points uh, because the Turkish law provides some other additional restrictions to this right and that do not exist among international standards. So I think it is useful to talk first about the international conditions. We can talk about two different sets of conditions. The first set uh, that I will mention are the conditions for a gathering to be protected under freedom of assembly. Uh, international standards for a gathering to be protected under this right are fairly simple. Uh, first, there should be a group of persons, as I said, gathering with a common purpose. Uh, the meeting time and venue is not decisive. It can be held anywhere, anytime, and can be protected under this right. Second, and most importantly, uh, the meeting should be peaceful. 
uh, there is no right to hold violent uh, meetings. Violent protesters cannot claim a violation of this right uh, because the right simply does not cover uh, violent intentions. If these conditions are not met, we say that partici participants to that gathering are not under, are protected under that right. If these conditions are met, on the other hand, there is an ex exercise of this right and therefore the government is under certain obligations in regard to that gathering and in regard to the participants of that gathering. This, of course, doesn't mean that the governments cannot interfere with that uh, gathering under any circumstances. The right to hold meetings and demonstrations is not an absolute right, uh, which means uh, the exercise of that right can be limited under certain conditions. And this set of conditions, which can be called limitation conditions, are threefold in international standard. The first one is the limitation on the exercise of this right should be provided by national law. The second condition, which can be called legitimate aim requirement, uh, stipulates that the limitation in question should pursue a certain legitimate aim. Uh, and these legitimate aims that can be pursued are enumerated by the article in question. Uh, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, cites national security, public safety, protection of health, protection of morals, protection of rights and freedoms of others, and prevention of disorder and crime as the legitimate aims that can be pursued. These are numerous clauses, so you cannot add any other aim uh, when you are restricting the freedom of assembly. Uh, the third condition, and the last, is the interference in question. The limitation in question should be proportionate to the legitimate aim pursued. All limitations should have all these three conditions. So if any intervention violates any of these conditions, we say that the right of the, of the participants have been violated. Thus, uh, it is true that we do not enjoy an absolute freedom to hold meetings and demonstrations. Uh, it is possible for the authorities to make certain adjustments as to the time and the venue of the meeting, for example, they, they also may postpone the meeting to another time or date. Uh, they may even ban the meeting on certain situations. But all these interferences should be justifiable in accordance to the conditions I cited. It is also possib possible for the authorities to uh, stipulate a prior notification or a prior permission uh, procedure according to international standards, but uh, all restrictions carried out with reference to these requirements should be justifiable under those three conditions as well. So up until here, we talked about the international standards. At this point, I should say that uh, our domestic written law is fairly compatible with international standards, like almost any other structural human rights problem in Turkey. The problems in regard to the freedom of assembly result from, mostly from the practice and not rather than the written law. Uh, of course, some problems arise from the re legislation, and I will mention some of them now, but we should bear in mind that uh, most of the problems arise from the practice, not the written law itself. So the Turkish constitution clearly stipulates that the right to freedom of assembly is to be exercised without prior permission. Uh, but it does not prohibit the requirement of notification. Uh, in accordance with that Turkish law on meetings and demonstration, requires for anyone to organize a meeting or demonstration to find six more people, form an organizing board, and notify the authorities 48 hours prior to that meeting taking place. Uh, thus, in Turkish law, we do have a notification requirement, but not a requirement for permission. This is a clear fact. This is explicit in Turkish constitution, but there are great problems even in regard to that clear fact. But in paper, our prior notification requirement is compatible with international standards. Uh, but there are certain categorical restrictions in Turkish legislation uh, which are not easily justifiable according to international standards. Uh, first, and probably most importantly, Turkish law on meetings and demonstrations do not provide a distinction between peaceful and violent participants. According to that law, Participant to an unlawful meeting can be tried in criminal court for the crime of acting contrary to the law, even though the participant in question was extremely peaceful from beginning to end. So you decide to join a gathering, not knowing that the notification requirement or some other condition for that meeting was not fulfilled, uh, or the meeting had instantly turned violent. 
but you are perfectly peaceful. You may still face prosecution and may eventually have a criminal record or can see uh, jail time even. Uh, this creates a chilling effect uh, on public from participating to public protests because you may never know uh, what, what would happen in that protest even though you are, as I said, completely peaceful. So the main problem with the Turkish legislation is that it does not make a distinction between violent and peaceful protesters, treats all participants to unlawful gatherings the same. Second, some national laws provide disciplinary punishment for unauthorized, ga- unauthorized gatherings in explicit contradiction with the Constitution. For example, the Turkish Disciplinary Code for Institutions of Higher Education uh, provides up to one month suspension for students having unauthorized it within campus. Uh, third, uh, there are time and venue restrictions provided by the law on meetings and demonstration, and these are categorical restrictions and often not easily justifiable within international standards. For example, there is a pro- prohibition of holding meetings and demonstrations within one kilometer away from uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, and this categorical restriction uh, often would violate uh, international law. Another example is uh, the prohibition of having nighttime meetings. Uh, in Turkish law, you cannot uh, exercise your right uh, at night. And this is, again, categorical and not easily justifiable. The problems in national law can be elaborated further, but as I said, I think there is no need because most of these problems can be uh, resolved through proper pro-human rights interpretations by courts but and other decision makers, by the way, but we see that problems only deepen in practice. Oku, dinle, izle, kısa dalga. What would you say about the right to meetings and demonstrations in Turkey? How free is that right? And is there an index to measure the situation? To answer that question, we could resort to indexes, as you said. We can resort to international court decisions. According to the Freedom House, Turkey's score on freedom of assembly is one out of four, a zero being the worst and four being the best. Uh, we got one, as I said. According to World Justice Project, as of 2020, Turkey has the worst score in Eastern Europe and Central Asia region on fundamental rights, including the freedom of assembly, and its global rank in that area is uh, 123rd out of 100 and Uh, 28 countries. Uh, according to the Cato Institute's Human Rights uh, Human Freedom Index, Turkey ranks 125th uh, out of uh, some 160 countries, and it, Turkey has or, an overall score of 5.92 out of 10. Uh, its score on freedom of assembly is 5 out of 10, and its score on civil society repression is 1.9 out of 10, uh, extremely low. Uh, these are all well-known international human rights indexes. As to the international court decisions, I can talk about the European Court of Human Rights, which I am most familiar with, but I should briefly explain the procedure that I will talk about. Uh, when the European Court of Human Rights finds a violation, the member states are under obligation to uh, implement that decision and remedy the violation in question. Uh, whether that state has implemented that decision is under supervision uh, or supervised by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. As to the supervision levels, there are two different supervision levels uh, created by that committee and all violations are classified under one or the other. The first supervision level is the standard procedure of supervision and the second is the enhanced procedure. Provision. So if a violation found by the European Court of Human Rights reveals an important structural uh, or urgent problem in regard to that member state, the Committee of Ministers supervises that case under enhanced procedure and more closely follows the progress. If a violation is classified as being supervised under enhanced procedure, we can safely say that that violation reveals a systemic problem, uh, an urgent problem to be solved in that state. And... Against this backdrop of information, we can turn to the court's website. And as of 
Today is 26 May. Uh, 96 different violations decided against Turkey that is being supervised under the enhanced procedure. This means that the European Court of Human Rights found a systemic and urgent problem in Turkey in regard to freedom of assembly 96 different times. Uh, for comparison, uh, Russia has 55 of them, Azerbaijan has 34 of them, and there is no other state that has 10 or more of them. So I want to break down the restrictions. So which institutions, people or incidents set the limits to the right to meetings? I think it is. it will be useful to explain the situation in Turkey in way of a uh, supposed scenario where the listener is a person in Turkey who wants to exercise uh, his or her right to freedom of assembly. I would like to chronologically explain what happens to them, uh, people who, want, who would like to express themselves, and I would like to show why this is a vicious cycle that only the government could break. So uh, you are in Turkey and you are not happy uh, about something, anything. Uh, you may be dissatisfied about how the economy is being managed. You may be mad because reported enforced disappearances in the 90s are not investigated, as is the case in the Saturday Mothers. You may not like the way the new rector to your university has been appointed, as is the case in Boston University protests. You may want your job back, as is the case in Migros workers. You may oppose to a new project that is scientifically proven to be harmful to the environment, as is the case in Ikizdere. Uh, and such, you may you don't have to be dissatisfied about something at all. You may just be proud of who you are, and want to show your pride, or as is the case in LGBT community. So you you want to go on the streets to show your ang- anger, your pride, or happiness. This is when you will encounter the first problem, uh, which is the bans. In Turkey, as I said, it is required by law to notify the authorities 48 hours prior to the meeting taking place. If you don't inform the authorities, this means that this automatically means that your demonstration will be dispersed, even if it's perfectly peaceful from beginning to end. This is despite hundreds of court decisions by the European Court of Human Rights, by by the Turkish Constitutional Court, by the Turkish Court of Cassation, by Conseil d'État, and the courts of first instance, uh, all explicitly stipulating that the failure to notify cannot be the sole ground for a meeting to be dispersed. Let's say you have informed the authorities, which are the governors of each town. Uh, as another bulk of court decisions say, your notification is being treated as a request for permit by these governments. And these supposed requests often get rejected by making abstract references to, for example, public order or public safety, uh, and they ban the planned meeting uh, with reference to those. Uh, This is despite that the Turkish constitution, as I said, clearly stipulating that there is no prior permission requirement, but as being treated such, these meetings often get banned. These are obstacles prior to the meeting. You you are not at the meeting zone at, at the moment, but you are already being banned from the meeting. And you, you, as the organization committee, may back down and give up the idea of holding a meeting or the meeting can take place regardless, but some people may hesitate to join. Uh, this, this is in itself a violation of your rights and of those people even before the meeting taking place. Uh, sometimes you get lucky and your planned day and time comes without the meeting getting banned. This doesn't mean that you are clear to hold it properly. So even when it is, again, as I said, peaceful from beginning to end, Thus, we arrive at the second problem, which is police violence. When you arrive at the place of the meeting, you will often see an army of law enforcement. They are not there only to protect you, as you may naively think. The police intervention usually starts with a warning throughout police, uh, through police megaphones, uh, declaring the meeting unlawful and asking for the participants to disperse. Uh, Often the reasons for this so-called unlawfulness are either not disclosed or themselves are clearly unlawful. Uh, If you haven't gotten used to it by then, you may be discouraged by that announcement and leave. And this is the second violation, actually, because you get discouraged and you leave without no actually legal reason. 
if you have gotten used to it, these announcements, and most people have in Turkey at the moment, you stay and try to continue your demonstration, and there comes the police interference. When I describe the attitude of the Turkish police in dispersing demonstration as extremely violent, uh, I'm not offering a subjective denotation. Uh, it is described as such in the reports of various NGOs, including Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, etc., And in the decisions of both international and national courts, it is so much that there are a number of decisions by both the European Court of Human Rights and by, and the Turkish Constitutional Court finding that the police intervention to a demonstration in Turkey was amount to, to be in breach of the prohibition of torture. So the police intervention can amount to torture in Turkey as uh, international court decisions has been found. Uh, so now you are being beaten handcuffed from the back, sitting at a police bus uh, at the meeting venue, or you are again very lucky and you are not among those people who are being treated that way. Uh, but you are at the meeting and these people are your friends and you don't think what's happening at the moment is, uh, is right, so you think it is wrong, and you take out your phone and try to record what's happening. You are now allegedly breaking another law because according to a new directive, Uh, issued at the end of April, uh, I presume, you are to be prevented from recording uh, the police during protests because recording the police officers while they are fulfilling their duties supposedly violates their privacy. Uh, now, you are probably under police custody, either because you were arrested by the police uh, for resisting to the call to disperse or because you were recording the incident. You may be arrested in a police raid at 5 a.m. next morning, as what happened to the students that had attended to uh, was the protest. And here starts the third phase, which is prosecution. Uh, charges depend. It can be resistance to police. It can be insulting the president. It can be charges related to terrorism, which happens more than you would think. You don't have to be violent at all for getting prosecuted, as I said before. At this very moment, as we talk, more than 10 women are facing prosecution for insulting the president by jumping in accordance with the rhythm or jumping to the beat because the crowd were chanting, uh, jump, jump, jump. If you don't jump, you are Tayyip, which is the middle name of the president. Uh, and those women jumped. Uh, to that beat, and they are prosecuted at this moment uh, for the crime of insulting the president. So you don't have to be violent at all, as I said. You can still pro get prosecuted. Uh, and your prosecution it is almost certain that during that court proceedings, you will be put under a ban on leaving the country, uh, during, uh, which may take years in Turkey. And in the end, you may get convicted and face prison even. And now you have a criminal record out of nowhere. Uh, you were just dissatisfied about something and want to take that out the streets. Uh, but this criminal record will follow you everywhere because when you apply for a job, this will come up. When you apply for a government grant, this will come up. Uh, the negative impacts of this unwarranted criminal record are endless. Uh, so you may be at times forced to leave the country if you want to have certain jobs. For example, being an academic is hard when you have a criminal record. In this case, you have to apply for a residence permit from a foreign country. And again, this record will come up. At this moment, we do have uh, a great number of second-class citizens discriminated on a daily basis uh, as a result of an unwarranted criminal record. At worst, we have... Radicalized groups of people feeling fed up from being left out, all being the result of a meaningless negative attitude towards the people's freedom of assembly. Uh, and this is a vicious cycle. When the government is unnecessarily harsh, and when these are what happen to people who raise their voices peacefully, it actually creates more problems for the people to complain about. Furthermore, as the government's human rights record goes low, Uh, reaction of the international community usually turns negative. Uh, this often results in socioeconomical problems. And as the relationship between Turkey and the European Union shows, uh, and this in turn creates even more problems to complain about for the people. 
and they go to streets even more and more, this is a vicious cycle that the government should break because people wouldn't and couldn't break the cycle. Uh, just think about the example of the Boğaziçi protest. Boğaziçi University, uh, one of the best universities in Turkey, if not the best, was generally known as a liberal school and their students and faculty were mostly away from politics. Uh, in fact, they may have been one of the furthest away universities from daily politics in Turkey. And at this very moment, the first example comes to mind is the students and academics of Boğaziçi, Boğaziçi University. They were beaten, jailed, suspended from university, academics protest director every day because of um, sticking up with an unwanted rectoral appointment, uh, an undemocratic rectoral appointment. Uh, this is the perfect example for this vicious cycle that we are in, sticking with undemocratic and unconstitutional policies such as harsh reactions of the police and blanket bans on uh, freedom of assembly only extends and begins up this cycle by adding more people in rather than intimidating the public away from using their right to protest. As I said, the Boas University shows that. Oku. Dinle, izle, kısa dalga. So how does restricting the freedom of assembly impact the advocacy efforts? My first-hand knowledge on this matter is not sufficient. I'm an academic and I'm not a lawyer by practice. And I think people who practice law before courts and members of NGOs are much more capable than, uh, than me to talk about the immense pressure they face. I thereby invite listeners to resort to various reports prepared by certain Turkish NGOs, such as the Turkish Human Rights Foundation, Human Rights Association. I remember reading some reports by Association for Monitoring Equal Rights and Helsinki Foundation. Uh, there are certainly others. There are reports by international organizations as well, such as the Human Rights Watch. Uh, so my tellings under this point are by proxy. It is cer- certainly true that the prob- problems on freedom of assembly and expression in general are felt by human rights defenders as well in Turkey. First of all, uh, bar associations are under immense pressure in Turkey uh, because uh, most bar associations are critical of the government. And in 2020, uh, the government has amended the lawyer's code or attorneyship law. Uh, in a way to reduce the effectiveness of the bar associations, especially the bar associations of larger cities. Uh, it is not necessary to go into deta- detail, but these amendments significantly reduced the effectiveness of these associations and made way for the creation of pro-government bar associations. Uh, I remember lawyers in Turkey starting a justice vigil in 2017 Uh, regularly gathering every week uh, in front of the biggest courthouse in Turkey, uh, which is called Çalayan, and protesting various injustices. They held more than 80 meetings. Uh, I also remember that some of those meetings were violently dispersed, uh, and some lawyers were beaten up. I personally uh, know someone who had their nose broken, Uh, and there was someone who had his leg broken, and some of them, some of these lawyers were arrested and prosecuted. Uh, as noted by various reports, in addition to those, as noted by various reports, civil society is under more and more pressure in Turkey, uh, starting from the state of emergency in 2016, and that, of course, affects rights advocates. There are human rights defenders in prison at this moment, uh, most famously Osman Kavala, uh, a leading civil society figure in Turkey, is still in prison even after the European Court of Human Rights ordered for his immediate release in 2019, December 2019 or January 2020, because the court found that his detention was made in bad faith, namely to reduce civil society to silence in Turkey. 2020, the uh, law and associations was amended as to empower the Minister of Internal Affairs to suspend certain members of an association, to appoint trustees to associations, and to block the activities of an association if that association becomes subject to an investigation. 
uh, note that it is not required for the minister to wait for the outcome of that investigation. Uh, mere op- opening of an investigation is enough uh, for the minister to be able to use his powers. This amendment, uh, again, created even more chilling effect on human rights defenders. Uh, of course, there are other ways to pressure them, uh, the human rights defenders. Most importantly, uh, political discourse frequently targets rights advocates in Turkey. It is really easy for anyone to be called terrorist in today's Turkey, uh, as politicians' use of that word is extremely loose. Uh, while most of the time the use of this word is not convincing, it is where it is a way of criminal criminalizing rights advocates, and it can be effective in interaction with independ- independency issues in the of the Turkish judiciary. There are examples of investigations opened years after the alleged criminal act, evidently because some government, governmental officer criticized that act the day before. Uh, so you can never be sure whether you will be mentioned in a government officer's critical speech and whether that criticism will trigger a criminal investigation uh, even years after your so-called criminal act. We've talked about the restrictions, but... Do they differ depending on the profile of the subjects using the right or depending on the context? Are there any examples of this practice? Um, the most striking thing about the interferences uh, with the right to freedom of assembly in Turkey is the extreme hypocrisy on the part of the authorities. And several examples can be given to that. Um Recently, recently, most often decided reason to ban or disperse assemblies is COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, at one, one point in Turkey, all meetings and com- conventions were banned with, banned with reference to high disease counts. Uh, however, even during the worst times of the pandemic, and while ban on all conventions were still in force, the ruling party routinely organized party conventions. Uh, which hosted thousands of people. Uh, a number of protests were banned and or dispersed with reference to pandemic-related measures, but the ruling party organized and held several meetings that same city, same week. Most recently, on May 1st, on the Workers' Day, a few hundred people attempted to gather in Taksim Square, which, was, which has historical importance as to the Workers' Day celebrations in Turkey. These people were violently dispersed and 246 of them as i read uh, were arrested the reason was because uh, at the time there was a full lockdown uh, enforced throughout turkey and they were found in breach of that lockdown uh, these people were fined for more than 800,000 turkish liras which amounts to approximately 80,000 euros uh, not more than 10 days later though Thousands of people have gathered in the same square, in, Tams- in Taksim Square, to protest Israel's violent a- attacks against Palestinians, but not one person got fined or arrested, and the demonstration was allowed to take place. Uh, full lockdown was still in force, mind you. Uh, a-, a couple of days after the Israel's protest, the Turkish Football League was ended, and the supporters of the champion team went into the streets, and they were allowed as well. But this hypocrisy is not new. I remember on March 8, 2019, uh, on the Women's Day, uh, women gathered in Taksim Square again, were, uh, and they were dispersed violently by pepper gas and plastic bullets on the same night uh, or on the next day. An Islamist group has gathered in the same square to protest some slogans chanted by those women, and that Islamist group was allowed to hold that demonstration, even though... Uh, hours before, women were dispersed in, from that square. What's the price of using your right to assembly beyond its limits? You get targeted by politicians. You get you got slandered by them. Uh, you can be arrested. You can be detained. You can face criminal charges. You can face jail time. You can have a criminal record. And there are examples that come to mind easily. For each of them, you can face all kinds of uh, negative impacts uh, when you use your right to meetings and demonstrations. There is actually 
no limit uh, as to what may uh, what you may suffer so how is the turkish judiciary handling such cases uh, so to answer this question we should be familiar with the problems in regard to turkish judiciary the turkish judiciary was restructured numerous times in the past 10 years the council of judges and prosecutors which is authorized to recruit judges and prosecutors, transfer them, promote them, sanction them, and much more, uh, is prone to undue influence by the executive and legislative powers. Uh, The structure, composition, and methods of appointment of the previous Judicial Council were changed by a constitutional amendment in April 2017. Uh, The Council has now has 13 members, Four are now appointed by the president directly, uh, the minister of justice who presides over the council and his or her deputy are ex officio members and these are also appointed by the president. The remaining seven members are appointed by the National Assembly and all members appointed by the parliament are to be elected by a qualified majority and the ruling party uh, and its ally currently have enough members to constitute this majority. Uh, so, uh, in other words, to, uh, the appointment of all members of this council is in one way or the other uh, presently controlled by the government. Uh, none of the members of this council are elected by judges or public prosecutors at this moment. Uh, furthermore, following the amendments to the composition of this council of judges and prosecutors, the numbers the number of judges and prosecutors subjected to involuntary transfers from one city to the other uh, increased substantially uh, the executive's influence over the judiciary has further increased uh, following the failed coup d'etat attempt on July 15 2016 and one third of the existing judges and prosecutors were dismissed without any individual investigation And in the words of the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, mass dismissals created an atmosphere of fear among the remaining judges and prosecutors. Furthermore, the need to recruit large numbers of new judges following the mass dismissals and the relative inexperience of many such new recruits had a significant negative impact on the overall effectiveness uh, of the judicial system. The lack of institutional independence of the judiciary and the chilling effect of the mass dismissals and the diminished quality and experience of the members of the judiciary that resulted from them are serious threats to the rule of law. Thus, to respond to your question, uh, Turkish courts are handling these cases as they may be expected to handle. Uh, There is a massive judicial independency problem in Turkey and accordingly Uh, The Turkish judiciary is not effective sufficiently or maybe at all, Uh, not only because they impose heavy fines to peaceful protesters exercising their freedom of assembly, but also because the impunity uh, they grant to violent law enforcement officers. You've been mentioning that this right to assembly, it's not an absolute right. It can be restricted uh, on conditions set by law. So I was just wondering, are there any examples of abusing this right in Turkey? And what would be the consequences of abusing the right? It is, of course, possible to abuse the, abuse this right. I remember that uh, during Gezi protests in 2013, some individuals attacked Uh, peaceful protesters with machetes and sticks and and an investigation was opened against them. Uh, during that investigation, they alleged that they were using their right to freedom of assembly uh, as the Gezi protesters were. Uh, this is, of course, an abusive invocation of that right. Uh, as I said, the right does not protect uh, violent uh, gatherings. So... The law on meetings and demonstrations provides several sanctions to those who abuse this right, and the severity of the sanctions 
depend on depends on the abuse. Uh, holding a violent and armed protest, for example, is punishable by up to four years of prison. Uh, of course, violent protesters may be sanctioned on other crimes in the criminal code as well. For example, uh, giving intentional injury, uh, and as the case may be, uh, other crimes can be uh, fitted to their approach or the behavior or their behavior. Uh, so it is perfectly uh, possible to abuse this, abuse this right, and there are several sanctions, but depend on the that those depend on the act that forms the abuse of that right. I may add something because the listeners are probably familiar with the fact that there is a general backlash on freedom of assembly throughout Europe. Uh, this backlash is not limited to the states with poor overall records on human rights. It goes beyond them. We may cite recently arising problems in regarding the freedom of assembly in France, uh, in, it- in Italy, in the UK, uh, in Greece, uh, in such uh, and such. And I'm I'm particularly familiar with the situation in in, in Italy, in which a uh, new law called Salvini Bis had increased the severity of the sanctions imposed upon supposedly unlawful protesters. Uh, I am familiar with uh, violent dispersion of environmental protesters in Puglia, uh, protesting the transatlantic pipeline. Pipeline. We are all familiar with the Gilles Jaune or the uh, Yellow West movement in France and the violent clashes between them and the police. Uh, in Greece, there have been several violent attacks against anti-fascist protesters and against mi- migrant migrants and asylum seekers. So there are problems throughout Europe, and they have been increasing recently. But I think the situation in Turkey is different and worse for at least three reasons. First, uh, the violence level of the police interference is often much more than uh, most of Europe. I'm I'm not the one saying that. As I said, the European Court of Human Rights repeatedly held that that the acts of the law enforcement while dispersing a meeting. Uh, in Turkey had amounted to a breach of the prohibition of torture. Second, uh, the law enforcement enjoys a quasi-absolute impunity in Turkey. Uh, I remember some French police officers being suspended after their violent attacks uh, towards people. I remember police officers being investigated and suspended in Genoa, Italy, after they have attacked a number of migrants in a train. On the other hand, I don't remember any investigation opened against any law enforcement officer in Turkey for his or her violent intervention during a demonstration. There may be, but I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Third, uh, third reason why, uh, explaining why the situation in Turkey is different and worse, is the extreme hypocrisy I mentioned. Uh, I'm not, of course, familiar with all bad examples throughout Europe, but the most obvious selective interference with the people's right to freedom of assembly arguably is happening in Turkey. Uh, I don't remember not one pro-government rally being dispersed, and I don't remember not one anti-government rally being allowed to proceed uh, if, if it at, it has attracted even a tiny bit of public attention. Professor Umut Orja, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oku, dinle, izle, kısa dalga.